and welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. So, we have a very interesting episode for you today. And joining me today is Dr. Pooja Sagwekar, who is a current postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Heart and Lung Research in Bad Nauheim. And currently, she's working on some things related to heart and lung. But previously, during her uh, PhD research back in India, where she did her PhD at the National Institute for Research in Reproductive Health, which is affiliated to the Indian Council for Medical Research, she was studying an important topic known as polycystic ovary syndrome. And specifically, her PhD was on the topic of the epigenetics and the pathophysiology of polycystic ovary syndrome here and after known as PCOS. So without any further ado, let's get on with the discussion with Pooja and see what she has to say about PCOS. So, Pooja, welcome to Offering Podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you. Maybe as a quick introduction, could you please tell us what PCOS is? Okay. Uh, well, PCOS, or as you mentioned, polycystic ovary syndrome, it's a very complex uh, disorder, mainly a hormonal disorder. And uh, uh, it's, it's one of the most highly prevalent endocrinopathies in women of reprodu- reproductive age group. And uh, most of the defects can be traced down starting from the brain axis. And uh, there are certain defects that in the, in the secretion of the hormones from the hypothalamopituitary axis in the brain, which start manifesting at the ovarian level. And as a result of which it uh, affects uh, most of the reproductive functions and not just the reproductive functions, but there are repercussions seen in the metabolic functions. And also you have several comorbidities seen associated with the disease okay so just to simplify things a little bit because you use a lot of a few big words (laughs) so what's endocrinopathy so endocrinopathy is basically uh, a hormonal disorder as i said but it is not just a hormonal disorder related to you know single or like maybe just two hormones but there is an amalgamation or uh, aberrations in several aspects of the endocrine Uh, axis you know uh, Mm -hmm. like for example uh, as I said from the brain you have defects in the pulsatility of these neurons that originate in the brain and because of which uh, there is this hormone called as luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone basically the two main reproductive hormones Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, affect the ovary and as a result of which the ovarian hormones are in the production of ovarian hormones is basically affected. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of uh, secretion of androgens, whereas maybe there is a suppression of estradiol. So and also there are, uh, as I said, metabolic repercussions. Mm -hmm. And also uh, that is basically affecting the insulin uh, arm and because of which there is insulin resistance in the body and so on. Mm -hmm. So basically to simplify Mm -hmm. the whole thing. So there are certain pathways which are affected in the brain or or certain processes Mm -hmm. in the brain which eventually end up affecting the hormone levels in the body yes which affect the ovaries and lead to the polycystic ovary syndrome yes okay so but why is it so necessary to talk about polycystic ovary syndrome because Mm -hmm. I, I, i i i would not think that it's prevalent among so many people uh, actually, it is. I mean, as I said, it affects mainly the women of reprodu- reproductive age group. And statistically, it affects almost one in three women. Oh, wow. So, uh, and a lot of women do not know that, you know, they are living with the disorder. Most of them come to know when they are trying to conceive. But uh, I would say a lot of adolescents, roughly 40%, I, it's it's proven, it's not that I'm saying, but... Mm-hmm. Roughly 40% of the adolescent girls are known to have the polycystic ovarian disorder, that is polycystic ovaries, and then further that can also manifest into the syndrome that is the endocrinopathy, as I said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what's the difference between uh, the polycystic ovary disease and the syndrome? 
right so uh, pcod or polycystic ovarian disease is uh, only when you know the polycystic ovaries are detected on an ultrasound sonography whereas the syndrome is basically defined by a number of characteristics or uh, it's a way of diagnosis so uh, there is there are three criteria which can be used to diagnose pcos but rotterdam criteria which was established in 2003 is the most widely used criteria so it's basically absence or irregularity of menses mm-hmm. uh there is the uh signs and sin- uh, symptoms of hyperandrogenemia that is excess of androgens in circulation mm-hmm. and androgens uh, are basically testosterone and dheas which are mainly the main male hormones right mm-hmm. so uh clinical or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenemia and thirdly it's the polycystic ovaries on ultrasound so any two of these are sufficient to diagnose pcos but not all women who have polycystic ovaries would have pcos so that's the difference in pcod versus pcos i mean i'm still a bit confused yeah. so uh people with polycystic ovaries may not necessarily have the syndrome yes but they may have the disease So the disease is basically just the presence of polycystic ovaries or it is also called as polycystic ovarian morphology actually okay. this is the more uh, accurate term mm-hmm. but PCOD is more like a layman's term you know okay yeah so but the but the syndrome mm-hmm. is is a much more complex thing because it's yeah. something which is affecting the hormones of the entire body yes so as i said it's the two out of those three criteria that i talked about uh which are necessary to diagnose a person or a woman as PCOS. Okay. Yes. Okay. So but so you you started by mentioning that there are certain causes for it. So it it affects the whole axis from the nervous system mm-hmm. as well as uh throughout the whole the, ho- the entire hormonal balance in the mm-hmm. body, right? So what is a primary cause of this? Is there any triggers that we are aware of? Uh triggers we are aware of yes but then uh, there is no specific cause uh, the etiology or the origins of pcos are still unknown although the disorder was first described in 1930s by these two clinicians um, stein and levental but uh, the origins are still unknown uh, so there is the genetic component which is a, which is very strongly associated with the development of pcos for sure so you have uh, you know aunts or daughters or uh, siblings cousins who can like you know uh, have this family tree of showing polycystic ovary syndrome so if your if your parents or your aunt or you know your grandmother had pcos i mean obviously the diagnosis back then was necessary so if you know that you are predisposed then you know there is a possibility you you would have pcos So again like th- this is not a trigger i mean this is a genetic cause right mm-hmm. and uh, lately it has also pcos has been also classified as an environmental risk disorder so uh, we know from ongoing research across across the gro- globe that uh, uh, it's you know these uh, plasticizers like the bisphenol a which leach out of the plastic bottles for example or the presence of some endocrine disruptors in the environment that we come in contact with inadvertently mm. uh can also be the triggers for polycystic ovary syndrome okay so, that's so environmental pollutants yes. created from human waste intervention or, uh, yeah, yeah so yeah. these can really affect i mean b- b- just just going back bisphenol a is mm-hmm. is a compo- compound that you mentioned mm-hmm. so it, it's present in plastic bottles Uh, oh. leached out of the plastic so uh, you know these take away containers mm-hmm. that are made out of synthetic materials especially plastic of course so uh, when when there is hot food or mm-hmm. you know uh, plastic bottles like the discard the ones which we generally discard after single use uh, so if you store the water or whatever you consume in these kind of containers mm-hmm. for a long time these plasticizers are kind of going oh. to leach out or if you pour hot stuff in these yeah. you, know, you know uh and they are going to leach out and basically accumulate so there is bioaccumulation of these uh, things in your body and it's not just a trigger for polycystic ovary syndrome but known to have a trigger for a lot of hormonal disorders even in men for sure yeah definitely yeah, yeah. so i mean this is it's an important point so mm-hmm. you so it seems like there is 
an environmental aspect to it That's but right. that is definitely by what kind of materials we're surrounded or we surround ourselves with yeah. as well as there is a genetic aspect to it true right so but but we're well, just going to the genetic aspect there a little bit so does this mm-hmm. imply that people from certain backgrounds mm-hmm. or with a certain let's say ethnicity for example do they are they uh, more susceptible to such disorders is it is it is there something some studies in that direction yeah yeah there are a lot of studies which show especially that south asian women are more prone to the disorder and also uh, as compared to caucasians a lot of mexican uh, african women are more prone so uh, populations which are you know more prone to say diabetes or mellitus or uh, hyperinsulinemia can also be more prone to pcos and vice versa yeah so uh, you mentioned diabetes and mm-hmm. hi- so so hyperinsulinemia insulin- yeah. and diabetes so these yes. are potential mm-hmm. risk factors let's say associated with pcos mm-hmm. right so does it mean so people who ha- are have have a predisposition to diabetes yeah. tend to have uh, more factors which drive the development of pcos or how 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 does that uh, work uh it's known to be both ways actually and uh so diabetes is directly correlated with the development of obesity right yeah so obesity so, but is this this, yeah. this is specifically the type 2 diabetes type 2 diabetes yes yeah. the but diabetes mellitus yeah, right yeah. yes uh so uh obesity as i'm as i was saying is one of the chief factors associated with the development of pcos uh but also we know from uh many many you know labs that uh, it's not just the obese who have polycystic ovary syndrome of course it's one of the uh, major factors a uh, lifestyle associated factor that factor that can trigger pcos but also uh, there are lean pcos phenotypes so we know that there are lean pcos phenotypes and there are obese pcos phenotypes and uh, so okay just to maybe make it a bit simpler okay. when you use the term phenotype yeah right so what 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 do you imply so phenotype is basically the outer appearance of a person and uh, that can be related to some kind of you can always correlate it to you know some kind of a genetic anomaly or you know some kind of polymorphism etc and depending on the diagnosis or depending on the characteristics of a person you can possibly go back to okay this might be you know the underlying uh disorder or something okay. like that so so again to simplify the whole thing okay. it's it's like so when you have uh, someone with a specific type of uh, outer appearance yes it's possible that the 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 version of the syndrome that they're di- that they're exhibiting yeah. is can be different from each other yeah for right. sure right okay yes so yeah i mean th- this this is this is quite interesting because you you mentioned that there are two types so there can be an obesity associated there can also be a lean pcos so yes. now what is the difference between those two uh so uh, women with lean uh, phenotype as i was saying and uh, lean pcos women they are not obese but what they have is central obesity so if you measure the waist to hip ratio then there is an increase in that ratio seen in these women but they are not overweight or they are not obese you know uh, as uh, compared to the overall appearance uh, so you can differentiate uh, by comparing the body mass index or the bmi which i think most of the people would know mm-hmm. uh, so if you uh, have a scale and uh, about 24 is what is considered overweight mm-hmm. and you go higher up it is obesity but lean women with P, uh, women with the lean type of pcos are not you know uh, having a high body mass index but uh, they still have pcos and uh, pcos generally uh, can be managed by you know uh, weight loss or by changing the dietary or the nutritional factors in mm. obese women with pcos ah. but it is the lean women uh, for whom the management becomes very difficult because they are what we call as a true pcos or just genetically you know uh pcos types yeah yeah so so the syndrome is a bit more difficult to manage yes. in in lean women because yeah. they're they're more they have a bit more of a genetic factor which is that's affecting that's true that's true okay so imagine i'm a woman walking down the street and i would like to know if i have pcos or not mm-hmm. so how can i diagnose this how can pcos be diagnosed 
Yes, so awareness uh, is the first thing that I would like to talk about because not many people know what polycystic ovary syndrome is. Uh, women are not mostly aware of this either. So, uh, first of all, knowing the kind of signs and symptoms you may exhibit and also knowing your family history, you know, whether there was a history of, say, infertility or history of irregular menses uh, in your family line, you know, that would uh, help, first of all. So, uh, and and um, uh, through the outer appearance or, uh, as I was saying, the phenotype, so mostly women would uh, uh, exhibit signs of hyperandrogenemia, that is the androgen excess. So, that is these persistent acne on the face, uh, which is the very first sign of excess androgens. Then uh, some women have uh, excess hair, you know, all over their body or sometimes just facial hair, which is equivalent to having like beard-like appearance or a mustache. Uh, so, those are the signs of hyperandrogenemia, not necessarily PCOS, but then of course you can try to build up whether you have something more like, uh, uh, you know, irregular menses for example. Mm -hmm. And if women are trying to conceive, then infertility is one of the main burdens of polycystic ovary yeah. syndrome. So, this is the way uh, first, I mean, this is of course like after awareness, women yeah. can uh, self-diagnose, I would say. Yeah, but I mean it's 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 important that one is aware of their uh how do you say like genetic history yeah right primarily because i i wouldn't so if you imagine uh you mentioned south asian women have a higher mm -hmm. predisposition to this as well mm -hmm. so it i can imagine that in the earlier days like you know the times of your parents or grandparents mm -hmm. maybe people didn't diagnose it yeah. So often because they just probably ignored it, right? Yeah. Because and and I think it's also quite common for people to not go to doctors because you know going to doctors itself is like is considered only when you're really sick, mm -hmm. right? So how right. how do you uh, encourage people mm -hmm. to you know uh, become more aware of this? Uh so I think uh, when just you know people generally talk at home and there are topics about like say I had. You know, maybe a grandmother would be telling the grandchild that, oh, you know, you I used to have topic uh, problems conceiving, or you know, the mother or the uh, aunt may say that, oh, I I also had you know problems with irregular menses or absence of menses. Maybe you also have that, so you know, you should go and uh, go go to the doctor. Maybe they will do more tests for you and stuff like that. Uh, so it's not necessarily uh, knowing the genetic background, but then it is through these conversations that even if okay one was not aware of the genetic background, you can now, you know, uh, you have the option of going and getting these tests done or, you know, getting some genetic counseling as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's one way to go about it nowadays. Yeah, definitely. But another question, because you mentioned it's it's, so it's post adolescent mm -hmm. stage it starts so but you know when can one so Im imagine i would imagine a person is trying to conceive probably in their mm -hmm. you know uh, mid to late 20s or maybe yeah. you know so in uh, probably in that uh, time frame mm -hmm. or like early 30s or in, right. in in that so that's that's going to be probably a bit too late mm -hmm. when someone tries to uh, yeah. understand this so what would you say is a more ideal time frame when people so when can it be diagnosed what's the earliest that it can be diagnosed uh earliest uh, so okay adolescents definitely start showing the signs but then it is during adolescence that most of the so when the menstrual cycles are getting established in a woman it is very common to have irregularity in the cycles so at uh, menarche which is the onset or the starting age of the menstrual cycles mostly Every woman experiences these irregularity in the periods, and most of the um, uh, most of the menstrual cycles have uh, uh, they are anovulatory. That is, uh, the egg is not produced actually. But then, uh, as you go further ahead in years, okay, like maybe three years down the line uh, after the start of menstrual cycle, five years down the line, and you know, uh, in your twenties or so. So menarche is generally thirteen years of age for. Uh, it's generally 13 on years. average yeah on yeah. an average but uh, say you go like you know further down the line and then it's say 23 24 and you still have problems of irregularity in the cycles menstrual pain menstrual cramps and uh, as i said acne or hirsutism these kind of signs then that is a very um, strong sign that you might have polycystic ovary syndrome 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, that would be a good time to go to a doctor then. Definitely. Yes. I mean, this is this is actually like almost like a public safety uh, PSA, right? Like so, we've got mm-hmm. like an announcement for people. So just you know, if if you feel you are able to diagnose yourself with any of these symptoms that yeah. Pooja just mentioned, maybe please just go check with a doctor. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so moving along this direction, we want to understand because you said that it affects the hormones of the entire body. So there's probably other health risks that are yes. also a, a, a consequence of the PCOS. So what are the other health risks that one one comes across? So cardiovascular diseases are one of the major health risks and also endometrial cancers. Uh, because I mentioned about this hormone estradiol, right? I mean, there can be problems with the levels of estradiol and uh, many a times it is either the less amount of estradiol stimulating your brain centers or even very high amount of estradiol stimulating your brain centers. Uh, both are known to be, you know, uh, triggers for development of PCOS. And because of uh, these aberrations in estradiol levels, it is the estradiol receptors present on the endometrium, which is another reproductive body part, of course. So that gets affected. And uh, so to put it very shortly, uh, I would say that the endometrium is constantly thickening Mm -hmm. because of the defects in the estrogen, uh, estrogen cycles, okay? And what happens is there is a term called hyperplasia, which is the thickening of this endometrial lining and which makes it more susceptible to cancers. Mm. So this is one of the major side risks and also other uh, comorbidities, as I said, development of diabetes because there is uh, excess of insulin. So it could be a cycle. Yes. uh, So like a loop. Yeah. And uh, hypercholesterol anemia. So this is uh, excess of cholesterol and lipid defects in the body. So a lot of things. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, this, this, it it seems like a fairly scary syndrome, right? Like, so this, this, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I I, I can, I can completely not relate with it because I'm completely out of the loop, but uh, to you know like I, I i could definitely warn the you know people around me to at least you know be aware of yeah something like this but you know uh you 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 mentioned previously as well like with people with pcos mm-hmm. uh they have trouble with conception yeah so is it is it is it only a little bit of trouble with conception or is it a bit is it like a per- more more permanent infertility of somehow uh a lot of people believe that it is permanent infertility uh, because of PCOS, but it's not the case. Actually, uh, statistically, 40% of women uh, with PCOS are known to, uh, 40 to 60% actually, are known to conceive by natural cycles. And this is by just modifying the lifestyles, uh, uh, exercising more, choosing more nutritive food. But as I said, that lean PCOS phenotype, you know, for them, it is... Uh, uh, really a big trouble conceiving and and then uh, women have to opt for IVF not all of them as I was saying but then IVF is one of the uh, main modalities of uh, management or treatment of infertility in these women yeah but, but so is that the most common uh, in, in so IVF uh, to for the listener yes. IVF is a short form of in vitro fertilization right so is that the most common uh sort of cure for this people with this type of PCOS who are having trouble conce- uh, conceiving or is there uh, another solution? So it's, it's not a cure I would say but it is one of the methods that is open uh, to these women to try uh, conception and, and uh, still you know there is a lot of stigma associated with uh, uh, yeah. having you know one's own bloodline and so people yeah. generally opt for IVF uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, people can also uh, opt for uh, artificial insemination because sometimes it is just, you know, the uh, eggs are of bad quality. Whereas in some women, it is just the hormonal disorder which yeah. you can manage and then IVF generally works for them. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, of course, allied fields, but uh, these are the options to try out. But as I said, if things uh, can, I mean, move on naturally with uh, by just modifying one's lifestyles, then this is what is advisable for obese or overweight women with mm. uh, PCOS. Okay. But th- is there any known cure for PCOS at all? 
uh, I won't say that. Uh, there is no cure, but uh, management is the right word mm-hmm. because once you have polycystic ovary syndrome, you can always manage it. And if you don't, uh, the the problems will aggravate. It's like that. Uh, but treatments are available. Uh, treatments are mainly, you know, uh, o- OCPs or the oral contraceptive pills. So what these do is uh, they no- normalize one's menstrual cycles. And uh, if the menstrual cycles are normalized, then there is ovulation. And if there is ovulation, then you have, uh, you know, proper hormonal control on the cycles and so on. So also there are more treatments available, of course, like insulin sensitizers Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because, uh, you know, in type 2 diabetes mellitus, mainly there is insulin resistance, which means that the tissues of the body are not able to utilize glucose properly uh, because of excess of insulin in the system. And so one needs to be given insulin sensitizers in that case. Or sometimes uh, the estrogen hormone that I talked about earlier, you have to uh, give some therapy for uh, stimulating the estrogen receptors and so on. So yeah, these are the treatments available. But of course, going to a proper clinician would be more apt. Definitely. Yes. So I mean, so if one is aware that they have a genetic predisposition to PCOS, so what can one do in order to not aggravate it or, you know, to prevent uh, the aggravation of the syndrome because you know you know you have a family history of it so mm-hmm. what can you do as right. a first step uh, maybe first you get the hormonal profiles done uh, if you are suspecting uh, that you know you may have PCOS uh, first uh, see a general practitioner they will give you certain hormonal tests based on which they can diagnose. Of course, there will be some uh, outer signs on the body by which they can also diagnose. But then to confirm, they will advise some hormonal tests like the LH, FSH, estradiol, androgens, which are like the main hormones uh, that are that go haywire in PCOS. So that would be the first thing. And then, uh, so also like maybe once you are diagnosed as having PCOS then you and of course it if it is something that is manageable as told to you by the physician okay you're overweight you we can manage your uh, syndrome okay so in that case adapting healthier lifestyle exercising regularly is the proper regimen and if that doesn't work then of course there are some mild treatments that the doctor will advise you uh, not necessarily something like the insulin sensitizers those are like you know given in extreme cases uh, but yeah, like, so these are the treatments that they will uh, give you, first of all. Okay. So let's move on a bit more in the research direction because <laughs> okay. we, we started off by mentioning that you did your PhD or your doctoral work on, on, on a topic, on, on PCOS, right? So yeah. your dissertation was on the impact of plausible extra genetic mm-hmm. factors influencing the development of PCOS, right? Yeah. So maybe can you like shed some light on what your work was about? Like, like, and what were the primary findings of your research? Sure. So uh, people know that, you know, there are genetic factors and when they hear the term epigenetics, it's a bit confusing. Mm-hmm. So first, let me explain this term. Epigenetics means something that is about genetics. By that, I mean that uh, there are certain chemical modifications which can sit on top of your DNA and alter its functioning. Whereas genetics is basically the code of DNA that is the very alphabets that write your DNA. There is something wrong going over there that some, something gets deleted, something gets added, something gets replaced. But epigenetics is basically chemical modifications, which is, which is why the environmental factor is so much yeah. important. Right. Uh, So slight changes on your DNA, like uh, changes in the methylation groups on your DNA or changes in acetylation. I'm sorry, I'm talking about these very scientific terms. No, this this is definitely okay because, I mean, I'm sure a lot of biologists in the audience are (laughs) definitely quite aware of DNA methylation and at least histone modifications related to epigenetics. But for those who are unaware of it, maybe I can simplify this a little bit more. So, so basically, like the the DNA when it's in our nucleus, it's rounded up 
around let's say certain balls which yes. we call histones right so it's ar- surrounding it's r- it's rolled up into a nice compact uh, mm-hmm. like structure and this methylation and acetylation all these processes they tend to either roll it up even more or unroll it yeah. a little bit so it's yeah. accessible yeah. and so so th- this is uh, what P- puja means when she says uh, methylation implies it compact. becomes more yes. compact yeah yeah so it gets more rolled up so the dna is not yeah. accessible for being uh, transcribed right. into rna okay so basically these are the chemical modifications that uh, decide uh, on you know whether a gene will be expressed or it will not be expressed okay uh, so what happens in most of the cancers is that a lot of uh, genes that suppress cancers are actually uh, more methylated and okay right so so it's the negative of a negative so it's positive <laughs> okay uh, so yeah let's not go into cancers but i would say that uh, epigenetics is uh, you know not so much explored in uh, these smaller diseases as to the extent it has been explored in cancers okay 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 and uh, dna methylation is one one of these epigenetic modifications which which governs the expression of genes and any changes little or uh, you know uh, really drastic changes can alter the function of a gene and which is why it can alter the functions in your body so in my phd dissertation uh, that was the epigenetics of polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, i was uh, what i found was that a lot of genes related to the androgen uh, pathways were uh, differentially methylated that is there was change in the methylation levels and because of which uh, also not just androgen pathways but also the oocyte uh, that is the egg uh, development pathway and uh, making of a good quality egg you know all these pathways were basically altered in the women with pcos and this was because of the changes in methylation in genes that are related to these pathways so those were my major findings i would say okay so basically you are saying so you identified that in women who have polycystic ovary syndrome mm-hmm. they had uh, the alterations in their genetic in mm-hmm. the epigenetic level yes. where they were unable to so the the dna was so like a like bit more compacted so it they were unable to express certain genes which are important for the normal functioning of the yeah. ovary or even less methylated Yeah. So that is what I mean by differentially methylated yeah. that okay. certain genes can be less methylated or some genes can be more, more methylated. Okay. Uh but so yeah. So basically it was altering the the genes which were needed for a normal uh, yeah. development of the oocyte development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Development and even maturation. So mm-hmm. uh once an oocyte develops, uh even the maturation part of it is important to make a good quality uh, oocyte that is the egg. so even those pathways were oh. were differentially methylated okay so i mean this is uh it's a, it's a rather significant finding right it, it tries to show at least that the the what you observe is a result of perhaps some of these uh, gene modifications which are happening yeah probably because of the environment or the lifestyles we do not know <laughs> yeah we, exactly so yeah. that's probably going to be th- my next question so what fields or what topics are being primarily researched mm-hmm. in pcos so globally if you speak about pcos research uh so epigenetics is more of a booming field now i would say uh because the environmental factors were not so widely associated with pcos earlier people thought it is more of a genetic disease so let's go on look for more of genetic markers but then several several uh, research articles down the line and people have still not been able to uh, identify that one genetic factor or like you know a cluster of genetic factors uh, that would be responsible for this disorder so people are now moving on to theories where you know the genetic as well as epigenetic uh, aspects of pcos both being important and both having a cross talk together or uh, first of all finding very strong candidates uh that would be you know both manifesting genetic as well as epigenetic hallmarks of the disease so yes uh it's it's like you know still uh a very nascent field where people are still trying to look for these identifiers or markers 
and that's the main focus of research okay so maybe i uh, i have one more follow up question mm-hmm. on the 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 topic that you were researching yeah. so you you mentioned that you identified certain epigenetic factors yes. or certain ep- ep- modifications yes let's say but is it is there any environmental way to reverse these modifications and is there is that a safe way of doing this in a way that it can be used to sort of regain the original uh cycle or r- the original uh pathways that were supposed to be activated or deactivated environmental way of you know reversing it is very very difficult because uh no i mean uh, the, the reason i'm asking is because you know you we can say the environment is what caused it but ca- it's, it's the like man it's the human intervention in the environment i would say which yeah, is yeah. the main factor uh but considering you know all the uh, all the different materials or uh components that we are exposed to it's very difficult to like you know control that factor where you are getting exposed to a certain component and probably having the risk of developing pcos but then of course like as i said maintaining a healthy lifestyle and nutrition is more important yeah. and uh there is a lot of research that shows that you know uh it is intake of more uh methyl donor foods that have methyl donors which is also something that is prescribed for pregnant women you know so that the fetus is healthy so and and also one more thing that i forgot to mention epigenetics is inheritable yeah so if if say a mother with pcos is nursing a baby and you know she's already say smoking or having these very deleterious lifestyles so there are certain epigenetic marks that can still go on to the developing fetus that is the child okay so it can be transmissible to the next generation yeah and which is why it is more important to address these environmental factors or lifestyle factors uh so yeah i mean just trying to be as responsible as possible for the future generations is the way to go ahead yeah no no definitely now i was just curious because uh you know it's uh, it's it's possible that someone acquired it so in- anyway mm-hmm. uh so moving along do you think i've forgotten to ask any question do you wish i'd asked another question about pcs because uh i feel like i i I've, i've learned a lot today but i feel like I, I, there are so many more questions that i could ask but i just don't know what to ask anymore do you have any question that you wish i asked ah uh, not that i can think of right now but uh Mm, no not really <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, is there something that you would really like to say before uh, we end our interview i think it was amazing that you know i got an opportunity for this kind of a public outreach and uh, people really need to be aware of pcos and uh, september is actually the 1st to 30th uh, of 2021 would be the pcos awareness month and uh, i think this podcast comes at a very opportune time for that definitely definitely i mean we it's it's really important that people are aware of uh, like you know human health is important that's true because uh, uh, you know human beings are uh, exposing themselves to so many so many factors in the environment uh, and and i think when when something that like so something like pcos can definitely have a huge impact on not just the the current generation also on future generations through you know through epigenetics or through uh, difficulties with conception or yeah. and uh, all of these different factors it it can really be a, a, a something which can which requires a certain amount of awareness which i don't see uh, generally you know because it doesn't get as much uh, Uh, like you know let's say air time yeah. as for example yeah, cancer yeah it's not as exactly like <laughs> and you know cancer has a re- similar incidence level to pcos like right like for example ca- one in three people are supposed to have are be are supposed to be uh, you know uh, susceptible to cancer in their lifetime and this is exactly the same it's one in three women okay so I i'm mean, not sure about the incidence of cancer really but uh, yeah I mean no, I mean <laughs> this was one of the talking points uh, that we right. had to discuss but anyway okay. so the the point the point I'm trying to make is so s- since cancer is so highly prevalent as well and so is PCOS mm-hmm. the awareness factor is yeah. quite important and uh, I think this is very nice that you came on the podcast to at least explain what it's right. about and 
it, it was an absolute pleasure to have <laughs> you with me today and and you know if uh, if the audience is thinking wait where is the other host uh, it's just me and pooja recording this one because we're finally both vaccinated and finally able to do an in person uh interview and uh, i think this That's is right. this is uh this is uh, a huge step up for the offering podcast as well <laughs> <laughs> anyway so thanks a lot pooja thanks a lot for joining us and for explaining the 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 origin and uh, of course like the 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 research that is going on in about pcos and uh, it's an absolute pleasure okay thank you so much all right With that we've come to the end of this episode of Offstream Magazine the podcast. I really hope you all enjoyed this episode and uh, you learned a thing or two because I for sure learned quite a bit about polycystic ovary syndrome and the various um uh, defects, the health defects that can occur as a result of PCOS. Anyway, with that stay tuned and come back to us next week where we have another exciting episode coming up for you and this week since it's just me it's three not signing off of the magazine the podcast is brought to you by the max planck phd network science communication working group and of the magazine the intro outro music is composed by shah trumpkar the pre-intro jingle is composed by gustavo carizzo please follow us on twitter instagram at of the magazine the podcast or on twitter at mpphd net podcast if you'd like to give us any feedback comments or suggestions please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de With that I bid you adieu and stay safe stay healthy see you all next week bye bye